Hello, and thank you for joining me. You're here with data science teacher Brandon, and we're going to start on the second part of our Spaceship Titanic comp Kaggle competition prediction. Okay, so in the first part, we had a data analyst, or we ourselves as the data analyst, prepared a whole bunch of insights to help our machine learning engineer prepare a model. So you could do this by yourself or do it in parts, but you really can compartmentalize the two disciplines. And this is a good practice in, in, in focusing on that and helping make sure your data analyst, data analysis is to the point and your machine learning part is also to the point. Okay. So we're going to start with this. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. So we're going to assume we did all the pre-processing uh, as what, or sorry, all the data analysis as was. And we're going to start with the pre-processing section, which really is where you can make your model better. It might not be the most interesting, it is very satisfying getting a better predicting model though. And this is really how you will make it. It's how you pre-process. So we're taking the look at the EDA summary right here, dimension reduction. When are we dealing with outliers? Where do we have other features that we could engineer? And so this was what we thought of up above. And what we'll do here is standard pre-processing though. We want to make sure that we deal with the null values. So is null sum. We have a lot of null values in our data set. Let's just check in here to see how often it happens in the same row. So sometimes there are two, two null values, but I thought it would be pretty dangerous if we were filling three of these columns with null values. So let's just experimenting here with how to get the index. So you can see here when I select these two, I get 36.22 and 72.18. If I take the index, I just get those values. So I'll just be able to drop the rows where they have multiple null values. And I was thinking just dropping the rows where they have three null values in one row, because that row just probably is not helpful in training our model if we're just filling it with the median values. It's not going to be the most helpful. So what I did here then is create a, a fairly complex triple nested loop, not so complex when you break it down, to then drop or collect the index values of the null values, whether it happens three times, and then we'll drop those and then we'll fill the rest of those null values. So what we're going to do here, we're going to go through all of this together. So we're going to go column one. So our first column in DF columns. So we're going through all of the list of columns. And then for column two in columns, in the df columns, so we're going to take all the list of columns, we're going to iterate through that, and then we're going to iterate through the second list of columns. And we're going to go if column one is not equal, so exclamation equal signs, not equal to column two, then we'll go into this next step. And then for col three, column three, our third column that we'll be looking through in our from all of our list of columns as well. And then if that third column is not equal to the second column in here, we'll get this, okay? And then this is all great, so we're just making sure that we're not looping through where it's all the same column across the row, because then all we would drop a lot of values. We wanna make sure that we're only looking for where each row has a null value in three separate columns. That's what the not equals to is for, okay? And then what we're gonna go do here is we're gonna go logical indexing so we're putting these inside parentheses right here you can see this is null so if the first column is null and that right there and then if the second column as well is null, and then the third column is null okay, so we'll do that we're going to check for all three of these we don't really need the whole row we just want the index numbers okay and then what we'll do is for I, well, you can print those out and we'll see that right here as we go through. And for I in ins, ins drop, and we're going to append the index values. So we have a list that we created up above, a blank list that we filled up with the index values that have three or more. And so there's not many that have three, but there are a handful. You can go down and see right here, these four rows have columns that have three null have have three null values. So there's quite there's a handful. Some some of them have quite a few. Some of them don't. But I thought it would be bad to train a model with basically filled values, the median values. Usually. So uh, it does not usually work the best. And so here is a way to get rid of those 
So we prevent so much bias from sticking into our model. Okay, so then we'll just do it simply. So we have our ins list that we want to drop. So we'll go df draw. And because we're just doing from the index values, we don't need to set an access. And then you'll see here, this will go to shape. Let's make sure we run this one up here first. So let's run this one right here and run and then we'll drop those rows afterwards and you should see that our shape has decreased our number of rows has decreased not too much but a little bit okay and we can see here that we've lost 184 rows not, not too much but a little bit so we got rid of those really those ones that will add a lot of bias that would be a lot of trouble for training okay or could potentially add on make our model less predictive on new unseen data that isn't filled with just mean and mean things. Okay. So we went through here. What we're going to do next is we're going to go through a loop and we're going to fill the median for numeric and we're going to fill the most occurring value for the object data type. So we'll do this all in a loop. We'll do the whole data set all at once together. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go four feet in DF columns. So we're not going to do the cabin ones, but we're going to go four feet. So we're going all the way except for the last two, the cabin zone and cabin code that we engineered. If feet not in this list, so in these ones is here, so including cabin here, we'll go and if the data type, so D type is equal to float, float, we're going to go df feet equals df feet equals to dot fill an a and we're going to fill that with the df feet and we're going to fill that with the median so the numeric feature okay so we're going to do else if else if that feature data type d type is equal to object object we're going to fill the na so fill na and we're going to go value counts. So value counts. And if you remember value counts, if you've ever seen me us use that before, it puts the value. So if it's let's say man and woman, if it was gender, it's going to put those in the index value. And then we just want to select out which one it comes up at the top, which has the most count of the value. We don't want the value because that would just be the count. We want to know what that index is. So we just want the first index and we're going to use that to fill up the when it's an object okay so run that here and now we can see no null values and we only we dropped a hundred and some rows and we filled the rest of them with median and, and kind of your standard filling practice okay? and there's certainly opportunity to try different ways to do this maybe the mean instead of the median works better mean should median should be the best but it's always good to try to take the stance of an experimental scientist and try, especially when this is for uh, a competition prediction. Okay. Okay. So let's go through here. So we're going to go through treating outliers next. Okay. So we have a list of our insights that we've collected that our data analysts are great, awesome data analysts. They did a great job collecting which ones that have outliers and what we would want to do with those. And so just making a note of them, we didn't really say what we should do. That's our job to decide how we would treat and deal with these others but it's good that he identified those and makes my life a lot easier just now i know what to do so he also did a great job of building some really handy functions uh so we're gonna use this hist plot that does a really cool job of just generating a random color and filling this this plot it makes a nice easy plot the title's set up very i could have done just an sns.hist plot but this is a nicer easier funner thing to use and so we worked as a team and i'm just using the function that he created up above so you can see here, we have a little bit, and, and we noticed one of the notes that said is above 60, there isn't really a huge difference in the effect with transportation. So with that, what we can do is clip. So we'll go df age equals to df age dot clip, and then we're gonna do upper. I'm just gonna truncate this a little bit. Bring this kind of in, okay? And if we look at that afterwards, we can see here, not too much bunching up. It's getting to be a little bit much, but we have the, on the other side the, the young, young age as well, and that should hopefully balance this out a little bit. A very non-normal distribution, but hopefully the average is a good representation of this data set. So 
Let's look at room service. Again, using our his plot that our great data analyst built for us. We're going to clip this. We'll start, let's start with a clip in this. And let's see exponential distributions, the ones that start up here, up and to the left and down to the right. They're a little bit of the trickiest ones because we can't really see here, but we know that it goes up to 14,000. There's, there's at least one spot over here, one, one, one value, and that's not very much in truth. We just want to truncate that, but because it's not trimming the, or truncating the edge of a normal distribution that just has a little outlier, a little tail, this is an exponential. It really is the distribution. So it's kind of tricky to just truncate these using clip. I started with this. What I was thinking is we could do binning for these. And this is something is a really great strategy. Uh, it can be very, very powerful. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this into buckets. We're going to create categories for this. And then we're going to turn those into one hot encoded dummies. Okay, so we're going to cut db.cut. We're going to cut the full series that we're going to give it. We're going to set our bins equal to these values right here. And then we're going to set our labels equals to ABC. So I only did three. I, I think you could probably do more and you might see an improvement in your scores as well. I started with three to be simple and easy, but that's definitely up to you to experiment. Try adding labels, try and break it down into more buckets and see if that helps your final predictions. Okay. So here what we're going to do is we're going to do that. So do that into buckets and just noting oh, and labels you got to this is a good little tip so i didn't put an s here labels i know it should be an s here because i'm giving it a list so it's expecting more than one thing labels and so it's a good little python kind of syntax you whenever you're assigning a variable to a list it's good to add an s and because you're python the arguments and the functions will also have that s there so it's full but uh, it can be a little hint in, in trying to figure this out. Because even if I was going to pass it one label, I would still need to give it a list of one thing because it expects a collection of variables, a list, or a tuple or something along those lines. So because now we're not going to work with the his plot, we're going to work with the count plot. Uh, my, my awesome partner, he did a great job of filling this in. And what we can do here, if we have any questions about this, we can go count plot. And then the question mark. And we can see what are the different values that we're going to pass. And if we wanted to look at how the full function was built, we can do two question marks here and get a better sense of the full, really what's going on inside of the function so we can see how it operates. Okay. Here, what we're going to do is just we're going to use the count plots. And now that we know what the functions are that we're putting into it, we're going to go, and let's look over here, transported equals false. But I want to see transported equals two. I want to see this in context. Trans no, it's not a count. Transported equals true. Here, I'm going to set this as true so that I can see the result of these categories in context of the target that we're going to be trying to predict today. Okay, find that very, very helpful, especially when you're thinking of do these make sense? Do these categories make sense? We want to look for that they have the same kind of balance across all three of these, uh, or that they have different balances between the, these categories, trues and falses. 50% of it, this has 10%, and this is quite a bit larger, it's, it's two thirds. And so really these have different characteristics and that's important because this will allow our model to use these categories in different ways to make predictions and it should give us better predictions, okay? So here what we're gonna do is hist plot, we're gonna look at it again. We're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna go pd dot cut. So we're cutting it, bucketizing it. What we're going to do is we're going to give it the full series. This is not, we're not giving it access to the data frame. We're just going to give it the series here. We're going to do food court. Okay. We're going to give it the bins and then the labels. Here. Do all of this and we'll do this one right here. And then we'll see our, using our count plot function as well. And we can see that these have slightly different characteristics. It's interesting that C uh, that category behaves very different than B. And it's very, very interesting that we're able to separate this and find such a distinct difference. And this allows for the nonlinearity because you can see here, this is closer to 50-50, closer to the C. And so whatever we're producing, it kind of goes down and then up. This is kind of nonlinear. It's not increasing in a straight rate. It, it really has a different characteristic in the middle. And this is what one hot encoding can allow for that just a simple using the continuous variable would not allow. Going to do that we're looking at shopping mall looking at our function here and then we're going to cut it and do the same look at the transport make sure i'm running these functions and then we're going to look at that okay 
and I set the seed uh, to 250 to kind of, I like the color of the first time I ran this, I just wanted to see and make sure it stayed the same. Okay. So you can see here, we now have these values right here. Uh, we have these three different bins that were created right here. Oh, sorry, and I want to do the labels, and I forgot to do labels equals noticing here just to find out. I was noticing this is kind of looking a little bit weird here with these counts. Like, that should be A, B, C, and it should be because I forgot to do them. Going really fast, it should be A, sure, it's lowercase, so no, lowercase, or I always stick with lowercase unless it's a class like a data frame. It's super important, but everything else really is not. So we just stick to lowercase for most things. So labels here, we're going to do our three labels here, and we'll run that again. Let's see here, now we have A, B, C, and A, B, C have the different characteristics. Again, just going through this, going through the next one, we're going to do one more bin, or we have two more to do, so pd.cut, and then we're going to give it the data frame, we're going to give it the bins, and we're manually setting the bins here, we just inspected the distribution. That can be a good idea, you can set it as with an exponential distribution, I would say it's hard to automate this process, it's really good to inspect it and see how you want to set these bins, these outside edges. So just highlighting here, we have we have three bins, we're creating three labels, so we're going to have four outside edges. So if you have one bin, you're going to have two outside edges and so on. So you're always going to have one more outside edge than you have label or, or bins. So one more bin outside edges than you have the labels that you're putting in. Something to keep in mind, an easy way to remember that. And we'll look at the count plot of the spawn. I love this random color palette that we're using to generate here because you can get colors that seem to go together, but it always goes right together, keeps it funny. It's quite a good time. Okay, so going into the next one, and then we're doing the same thing for the VR deck here as and running that as well. So it won't make us do that over and over and over. Okay, so now we're getting into dimension rhythm. And really what I mean by this is to reduce the number of categories we have in a feature, because we're likely, in, in this situation, we will be one hot encoding these features. And so dimension reduction, we have less columns. We're trying to reduce the number of columns. We're, we're kind of taking it, we're, we're preventing the amount of columns from getting too large or features from getting too large. So here, we, we can see here that these categories show no real destination and there's really no change for PSE. So let's inspect the PSO in the destination category. So there's no change in regards to that one for true or not false. But the, the truth is, I actually couldn't find what I was going through this. There was no real clear way to decide if I should move PSO in with Ken Cree or with Travis. It didn't behave like either of them. You can see it's really the difference between transported when they went and left. It doesn't really make a difference. And so I decided to leave it as it was and not make a change here because these two are being used in different ways. These two categories will be used by our model in different ways when we create the one hot features from them. But here, it didn't really look like behave, so I left it as this. Okay, looking at cabin zone next. Okay. What I see here is cabin zone has a lot of features, and I made notes here. G, T, A, G, A, zero, and T don't really show a difference. And so you can see here, zero shows zero difference, zero difference really zero, and, and all of these kind of show. So I'm just going to replace A, zero, T, G with A, and put those together and replace all those to kind of reduce the amount that we have. And then we're just going to be left with a small number of them. And we're gonna see, what I noticed here though is still D. I didn't catch that the first time. So I'm going to replace this again and do this one more time, sometimes happens, and we'll group that together into, uh, end up calling everything D after we go through this. And now we have features that are all kind of a little, behave a little bit differently or all distinctly. This one is showing no difference, the D category. All the other ones behave a little bit different and we're allowing our model to find a way to push off of those specific features. Okay, so really good. So now what we're gonna do is engineer some features. So we made some points here, food court. Those who did not go to the food court have a much higher chance of being transported. Uh, so if you didn't go, that's good. And so no visits to the spot, also 16% chance of being transported. So I thought it would just be good to highlight that and see if we can boost our score a little bit. That is risking overfitting by, you know, it's for Kegel competition, so you, you might get a good score. So we're gonna use dot apply with this function that we created. It's easier than using a loop to go through this. So we're gonna go if x is equal to zero, we're gonna assign this value to one, else 
assign this value to zero. And we're gonna return the value. And so what X is going to be is the value in the row as we're using, we're essentially gonna iterate through the each row. It's gonna be the value in the row, it's gonna check that value if it's greater than or less than, and then it's going to assign value and we're gonna be returning that value. Uh, it's gonna either be one or zero. Okay. So we'll apply this function, apply binary for zero, the function we're just creating, I'm gonna spell that right, apply, and then here we'll apply this function, so x y x for zero. Okay. So if we query here, so just gonna make sure I run this function that we created, and then I'll run the creation of this, and we can see here we'll do the value counts of those. We separated, so 5,300, 5,500 right here didn't go to the food court, and those ones had a much higher chance of not going. So hopefully our model will be able to build a coefficient off of these ones That's that really we noticed were an example of when it had an effect for whatever reason on not going. If you didn't go to the food court a lot, you're able to get sort of saved in our spaceship. Okay, so we're going to create another one for the age less than four, because we also noticed that that was when the age was less than four, there was a much, much better chance of being transported. So here what we're going to do is binary less than four. Okay, we're gonna put in the colon right here. We're gonna go if it's oops, here, less than, less than equal to four, we're gonna assign value one. Else, which is just we're gonna put the colon right here for the sharp or else statement. And if it's else, if it's not less than zero, we're going to put it as a zero. So in here, we're going to go less than four, age five, and we're going to apply, we can just copy and paste this. I think it's always good to write out things that you'll be using often, like the, the, the library's functions, just so you can get practice with those. When you make your own function, you might only be using it one time. It's not so important to build that muscle memory, and it's less important if you just copy and paste those things. It's good to practice if you're gonna be using, say, the sklearn library and you're using their functions a lot, so you don't have to look at their documentation. It's a one-time function that you wrote. It's totally fine. Just copy this. Again, this really matters for the uh, muscle memory. Okay. So what we're going to do here is I created a list of all of our features. So we're going to go features category. And these are all of the ones that are going to be one hot encoding. And so I did our binary values here as well that we're going to do small zero, food court zero, our bins, and the one or two features that we had from before. Just categories naturally. Okay. So we're gonna go df equals to pd dot get dummies. And what this is going to do, we're gonna give it the full data frame and we're gonna tell it the columns here again with the S. We're giving it a list of the features we're gonna be doing it. So here's gonna be processing all of these features. And you can see after we run this, we now have 48 features. Okay. So can be really big, and this is why we did as much as we could to reduce the dimensions, and why I only bucketized into three categories, because 40 is getting a little large. We do have actually quite a few rows, but 40 is still quite large, and it might be better to see if we can even reduce that, or we might get a better score if we reduce that down. Okay, so now finally get into the modeling section. Okay, so here what we're going to do is we're going to go df.columns. And the reason I run this is I want to take a look at all of the column names. I usually just copy and paste this and make sure I'm being good and copying and paste the correct ones here. Don't don't copy and paste the target into the features. But I do this uh, just because then I can control, and this would be good for your experiments, I can control which ones I want to use and not. So my workflow will work all of the same if I just comment out one of these features and we can see if that is truly valuable or not valuable. You could say maybe things like the PSO feature value, this one right here, Maybe my model is better with that one that didn't really seem to have an effect in the home in the destination being PSO might not really have mattered at all. So we're going to leave it for now, but that could be something to play around with. And this is the way this is set up is to allow for your ability to experiment because we have to assume that we don't know what is going to work the best. So we want to be able to experiment and try and find that mass. So the more you experiment, you get some more intuition about what will really work well. But it's always good to kind of take that 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 experimental scientist standpoint and just experiment and see what really truthfully the data says. Listen to what the, the, the data tells you. Okay, so we're going to send that to a list of features and a list of targets. We're going to send that right here. We're going to then put that into the data frame features. 
and then target, and we use that to make our X and Y values. So we're not going to do a train and test split because we're going to use grid search CV on this, and we'll use all of X to train our model for our final uh, predictions and stuff like that. So we use this list of features again, which is really, really handy. So here we're going to do is we're going to import grid search and we're also going to import metrics, make score and accuracy score. Okay. So we're going to go through this. We're going to go grid search. So our first thing, we're going to make a grid search thing. We're going to make in the first step where we're going to call a grid search CV. So we're going to import that first. What we do is we put our model and we're going to be passing our function to model, passing, passing our model or this function, a parameter grid, a grid of our parameters for the C, for the grid search. And then what we're going to do is we're going to scoring is equal to make underscore score. And we're going to put into this our accuracy score. So we're going to use accuracy score to determine what's good and what's not. So that gives us our grid object or essentially our model. Not exactly a model, but we can use it like a model to train a bunch of different models at once. Okay, so fits, we're going to fit our grid as well. And what we're going to do is what would be really good and, and what is often missed when we do grid searches is the, the first value, the first 10 could all be very, very close to the same score. Is the first one really, if you did a hypothesis test, would that really pass that those metrics are better than the one below it if it's only a 0 0.0005 difference? And you'll see here, we get a lot of those very, very close scores. It's better to understand the group of models that give us, so if it's, let's say, max depth or number of estimators, what are those values that really play in to give us the best score most of the time? And so it's really good to understand not just what the best, best model is, to understand what the best models are and really choose the features that are more robust that could give us a better answer because we might find things that really don't seem to matter. A good example is subsample in gradient boosting really didn't matter. We could use whatever size we wanted and really seem to make the difference. So that's not what we want to focus on. We want to focus on the things that are going to actually make a difference. And that's really what grid search is about. And I think seeing what we'll see here is really, really valuable. So what we're going to do is we're going to fit this. We're going to make a temporary data frame. We're going to call this data frame. Data frame. And we're going to put another data frame around our grid object and we're going to go cv underscore results and then underscore because it's an attribute from sklearn we always have to finish it with an underscore and then what we're going to do is we're going to get these values and what happens here is the params are going to be one column and the mean score is going to be another column the params is a list of all of the different parameters that we use in our grid search which is not work real for comparison's sake. So we're gonna to have to expand this out a little bit and which makes it a little bit more difficult, but we'll be able to, to do that no problem with this function. So we don't have to do it every time. So then we're gonna sort the values in terms of our mean test score because that's what we're caring about, what our mean, what our test score turns out to be at the end. Okay. So we're going to do that. Okay, so we've done that now and we're gonna set ascending equals to false. So we want the top one to be the biggest value to be at the top. We're going to create a temporary or a summary data frame here. We're going to create a blank or sorry, a blank summary data frame that we'll be adding through, adding to in a loop. We're going to create mean test scores, a blank list right here. We're going to go mean scores append row equals one. So this is position two. We're going to go from this row, position number two, which is going to be mean test scores. We're going to append that score. We do this as well. We're going to create another temporary data frame. So we're going to go pd.data frame. And we're going to go row zero. So what this is going to do is row zero. This is the params. So we're going to create columns, names with these parameters here. Okay, that's great. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a temporary data frame. And we're going to concat this data frame. We're going to go df summary and so that blank this blank data frame here we'll start filling it up and just like we did the blank list and then we're going to put in our df temp okay so we'll do that and then we'll go mean score summary and what we're going to do here is we're going to go mean underscore test underscore scores Oops, scores okay so we're going to put that in there we're then going to go 
reset underscore index. We need to reset our index. It's get messed up here. And then we'll print the head. Then we'll look at doing a pair plot. So we'll go here. I think it really turns out to be quite cool. Pair plot about data equals DF summary. Q equals because we have some some features, some some parameters that are just um, object type class categories and so we can change the color of our pair plot by this to, to get a cool extra effect. We're going to set our palette equal to the random color generator from our palette that we created that our data analyst, a really awesome data analyst created for us. And then we'll show this plot. Okay. So let's run this function here. Yeah, everything's good. Okay, so I think it's good to always practice with importing, writing out the imports because you don't do it very often. And it's kind of tedious if you have to always look them up when you do them. This is practice right here. So from sklearn.neighbors import k, k, capital K, capital N, neighbors, and classify. Okay. So we're going to import this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go k and c is equal to just the blank. Uh, K neighbors classifier, so just default settings. We're then going to go, so we're, after we're done that, we're going to go to dictionary. We're going to create a dictionary for a parameter, and we're going to go n underscore neighbors. neighbors. There we go. Okay, and neighbors is equal to on a range from 8 to 16. We're going to try our weights in uniform or distance. And then we're going to try our leaf size as 5 to 30. So we'll try all of those. And okay, so we're setting our, our parameter inputs. And what we're going to do here is we're going to call this function grid underscore search. Create it up above. And we're going to give it our model, so K and C. And what we're going to do then is give it a ramp. Oops. Uh, RAM, KYC, K, K and C, K and C, okay, perfect, K and C, and then we'll run this, okay, so we'll start running this, and we'll start working on the, the next ones as we let our first grid search run, okay, okay, so one of the things you'll notice, uh, you get a lot of warnings in these, this, and I, I find that can be a little bit tedious sometimes, so we're going to go import warnings, and we're going to go warnings, simple filter, and ignore. So we're going to ignore those things up above. Let's import our random forest next. So we're going to go from sklearn.ensemble. Pop up ensemble. And we'll go import random forest. We're then going to do in our next one, which sure is showing the red still. I'm pretty sure that your name is spelled correctly. There we go. I spelled classifier wrong, so it's good that I noticed this is really helpful that Colab highlights when things are called for that don't really make sense. Okay, so here what we're going to do is we're going to go n underscore estimators. We're going to go, we're going to go here max. Depth. We go min samples leaf, and then we're also going to do our cry criteria. Okay, so we're going to try these few right here. Okay, and so these are going to change your colors, and we go through this. I'm not going to run this right now, just because it's going to take a while because it's running up above. RF, and what we're going to do, we're going to go RAM, RAM underscore arc. This is a parameter that we set up up above. You can see the first one stopped running. And so let's, let, let's look at our first, let's get our second one running as we go through this. Okay. So let's look at this. And we can see this is why I find this very, very Okay. Well, you can see here, all of the scores turned out to be quite similar, which kind of a little bit concerning. You can see all the first 10 scores did, did 
exactly the same 0.75. Not the best, but we did all the same. You can really see the uniform weights made the difference in our mean test score all the way to the right. Really, that made a big difference. Almost always, all things being equal, it seems to produce a better score. You can see that in neighbors, you can see that as it increases to maybe, let's say, 12 or 11, it starts to get a lot better, and then really it stops improving in terms of our mean test score. And we can see that leaf size really kind of uniform across. It really seemed to make no difference. It's really important to understand. Not just that this leaf size that was our best model by default really doesn't matter. So we want to understand that when we're building our final model for predictions or putting a model in production. What really makes a difference in our model? What makes it robust? And so we can see that weights always is the best. K neighbors, 15. So it did make a difference having more neighbors. Although you could even say 13, 14, 15 really didn't make a very big difference. And so this could be very, very interesting. We know that that's a robust one. We know that leaf size is a little bit, we have a lot of wiggle room in terms of what we could use for that. So that's one of the reasons that I find this technique in terms of understanding our grid search can be so valuable. And I'm just noticing this error that I got here. So if you look here, if we see invalid parameter for N estimator. <laughs> uh, so it's supposed to be estimate. I'm going to copy and spell this because English is tough sometimes. And so we'll run that right there. So n estimators. N estimators is what we need for this. And stop. Okay. And while our random forest is starting, our grid search is starting on that, we, we're going to have to wait for a little bit. So I will probably come back to this when we're done. But I think I've explained really good what we're looking for and why we want to why we want to look at the full grid search and not just the final result of the grid search because it can be a little deceiving. Okay, so here what we're going to do is we're going to set up another grid search for gradient boosting classifier. And just to find this a little bit differently, the dictionary, the param grid, just to show a different way to do this, just we're going to do it in curly brackets as a dictionary instead of in the dic function in Python. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do our next one here. We're going to, as a string, learning rate is that. We're going to do our n estimators. Try to spell that right this time. And the last one is our max depth. So let those ones run, and then when we run our good search down below, we're going to see this. So just in the interest to have something to talk about, I'm going to not let this run. And oh, I'm just noticing one thing right here. I forgot to do this right here. And Google Colab to the data is telling me I forgot something. So we put the range, so empty range, starting at this number up to this number by a step of 0.05. Okay. And so this is really good. So this again shows us what we're seeing here. So to analyze this, I would always look at the mean test score. This would be the most important one to understand. You can see that the deviance, exponential, or loss didn't have a huge difference. Deviance tended to be the best one, but it's very marginal how much it is better than the other two features. What we can see here, though, is the learning rate. We can see that at a lower learning rate, we got we could still do really well, but we also had a chance of getting a very bad score. And then that kind of went away. And then as we started increasing our too much, we started still potentially getting good scores, but potentially getting worse scores. So give some context to what is actually the best learning rate. Maybe somewhere right in here, these two would be better. 0 0.1, 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 might be better than 0.2 because we have a higher chance. We can get a higher score and we have a better chance of getting a higher score on the bottom side as well. You can see that's for N estimators as well. It did a really bad when it was under 200 and then it starts to go up. But I would say something like 350 really gives us the most confidence that we're going to get a good score most of the time our model is almost always going to work well for this one. You see the same thing for max depth. At a certain level, really I would say almost two or three max depth right here it tends to be significantly better. It can be a little bit bad though here, so just something to be cautious of. But most of the time it's very, very much robust compared to say 11 max depth over here, which is really giving us not a terrible score, but almost an always worse score uh, than the rest much tighter the range of the scores is less but it's not doing so well overall okay so really good we're gonna do the next one
uh, logistic regression. I'd like to try just something simple as well. Maybe it does better, it usually doesn't, but it might do well. And so here we're going to import from sklearn.linear model, import logistic regression. Okay, so we're going to import logistic regression. And then what we're doing at here is calling that. We're going to set our penalty to L1, L2 elastic net. And then we're going to set our L1 ratio, ratio to zero to two, just to try and turn out how much we're focusing on one versus the other. And really logistic regression being such a simple model didn't really have a huge impact on the final score. So you can see here, really, really nothing made a huge difference. I would say linear model, that's not our best model, or sorry, logistic is not our best. And we're also gonna try here, ARD regression. Let's try and see if we can get a good one out of the regression model and see if this works well. I like to try this just in case. Sometimes it does very, very rarely, but just to practice another. My favorite linear model uh, is works so much better than just regular linear regression. So it's good to always good to try. It's very impressive how well it works sometimes. Okay, so regression is not the best though, so we would not expect this works well, but just again to show another great search here. And there's not too much we can do for this. We're just going to normalize this. And I would say this is one of the few models that almost always the default settings work better than the um, than really playing around with it. So just kind of leave it. Because this was the best one for ARD regression, and then we're going to put ARD into our grid search here. Okay, what I what I do last is I make a list of our model names, models, and I'm going to make a list of our data frames that we created that, that reduce the summary statistics. It's nice seeing them all next to each other, but I want to see them all together and really see which one works the best. Now the problem is, is we don't have the name of each model in in the model. So what we need to do is just add that quickly, and we'll do that next. Early. So we're making these two lists. We're going to go for M comma model and then M for model and then data for our data frame. Just to call it a different name. And here we're going to zip. And zip allows us to iterate through two lists at the same time. Really what it's designed for. So here we're going to go through model and data frame at the same time. We're going to go data, which will be our data frame each time. We're going to create a new column in that, and we're going to assign it to our model name. So it's going to create a reduced name, and we're going to have a column with model and the model that we're looking through each time. Okay, so we'll do that, and then we're going to create a summer. We're going to concat all of those together. We're going to concat all of these data frames together. We already have this list from above. All we've done is add the model name to this, so we're just going to concat those. And we're going to go across axis zero, so we're sticking them together vertically. And really what's interesting here, you can see here that random forest did really well almost always. And I, so I would say random forest is our best model. It's consistently done the best. I would say that when we look at the criterion for this, we can see that entropy did really well. And we can see that our mean test scores are really not, there's no way those would pass a hypothesis test that they're statistically different. But we can see Ginny did really well most of the time. And in, in large parts, I would probably use Ginny here. I would probably use a max depth. You can see here, it doesn't really make, it does make a difference, but nine sometimes is done good, 13 is done good, 11 did really well, or did, did well as well. So really something between nine and 13 could be good. I would probably start with nine, and we can see the same thing here. We, we get kind of a confusing result here for the min leaf samples, seven, 11, two, three, and these scores are not even a 0.1. 0 0.001, 0 0 0 001 away. So very a fraction of a fraction of a percent, which is not super helpful. Okay, so we can see that estimators as well. That this is a little bit more insightful because we have 50, 100, and 100, 150. We can see that less tended to do better than say 300. 300 is only up here one or two times in the other ones. I would say that lower is better. And when I would examine the random forest printout right here, if this is done running, it's not done running, but if you examine this when this is done running, this will help guide you to which one you should use. You wanna use a rule of thumb, the simplest, best version. And so I would say something between 150 to 
sorry, 50 to 150 would be the best. Maybe starting with 100 is putting it in a little bit, because uh, that also has that. Also, giving a lot of context of what actually did well for us. You can see our model only has some of those features, but really we can see now that our mean test score that random force and then gradient boosting still very, very close. Really, again, a 0 0.0004 less than the, the, the worst great uh, random force. So this is still an absolutely possible model and likely would not pass a statistical hypothesis test saying that one is better than the other. So it might be worth trying both of them. And that's what I, I set up here for you guys. So I set up final model with random forest or with gradient boosting. I import the data here and we're just going to import it from my reservoir. We're going to switch to null value. So we have to do the same processing that we did to this for, for a test competition predictions where we only have the tests. So the new data set, we have to do the same. This is kind of really part of our model. Fill the values the same way. We have to do the same outlier treatments. We're doing all the same bucketizing that we did. And I just copied and pasted this and changed the DF test for DF. Okay. And we're going to do the same uh, engineering of features, the cabin zone that we did up above, that our data analyst did up above. We're going to go to cabin code as well. We're also going to get the feature engineering that we did, the binary for let for zero, zero, and the binary for this one. We're going to put that into a list of categories. We're going to get our dummies. We're then going to take our features list that we had up above, and it should be the exact same features. If it's not, we have a problem. So it's a good check to make sure that everything is the same. So features from our list of features that went into our model up above, the same that really the features are what our model is. And so we're going to go assign that to X test. We're going to fit it to our X and Y. So we're using the X and Y from the first up above the first time we did our modeling step, the split, the X, Y split here. We're going to use those to train our model. We're going to set x test sum and we're going to check make sure no null values. We're going to predict right here off the x test. We're going to set that to y predictions. We're going to put our y predictions into a data frame. We're going to call that data frame tra transported and we're going to just replace those uh, values ones and zeros with trues and falses because that's what they wanted for the, 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 the format they wanted for the predictions. We're going to set another column to passenger we're going to take this from our original the not the original the test data frame the passenger ids and put that next to our predictions put that x axis one which is going to stick them together sideways and then we're going to create a, a csv file name submission call whatever you want and then go there and so what this is going to do you'll see it under your folder it'll appear right here it'll appear in your 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 collab in the file you can download it and then what you would do is you go to submission predictions and you can submit I have another one ready here let's see what else I downloaded and submit my predictions right here and I'll put that in and I'll submit this and we'll see how well I did dun 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 so the last as I had I was curious to see how well I did and we can see I got 0.77 not truly not 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 very great but let's look and see what everyone else did so let's go to, you can see here the best score so really point, point 0.1 is better. That's a quite better score, but you can see that drops off very quickly. And then most of the scores are really about a point 0.8. So really we got a point, point 0.3, point 0.4 less than the bulk, really the second place kind of for Germany A scores. So very interesting to know what, I'd be very interested to know what this person did here in the first place, but he also submitted it 28 times. This person submitted it 200. And, so it could be random chance that he did so well. It could be just that random you know, random train test split made it better. But here what we're seeing is that really the bulk of the scores was pointing. So we did quite well, although our predictions, if we got to jump to my score, I'm in 16th hundred place, which is, you don't have to be far off from the top score to be quite far down. So you can see here, we did. I would love to know what you did. I would love to hear, hopefully you can improve upon it, experiment with the different things that I did and see if you can beat my scores. I'm still learning and I'd love to hear what you did to improve upon. Cheers. Hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next time.